I do. And whenever you're ready, Art, just uh, go ahead and tell your story. Okay, great. Uh, thanks for having us today. Just a quick question, and I should remember this. Are you going to ask questions throughout the presentation, or, you, or do you typically wait to the end? Well, we could do it either way. Is there a particular way you would prefer? I'm, I'm fine with either way. Okay. So whatever, if it... Uh, if, if somebody it, has a burning question exactly. about something you've just said, we'll jump in immediately. Otherwise, we'll Sounds good. to the end. Okay, thank you. Well, I'm going to tee this up. So thanks again for having us uh, here today, allowing us to uh, tell our story. Uh, we're, we're not only going to talk about FY18 actual financial performance, we're also going to get into our FY19 uh, current to date and then also future. This is our agenda. It essentially corresponds to the requirements of uh, the letter you sent to us a couple weeks ago. I'll let you look over that briefly, but we'll cover each of the bullets and then also the sub-bullets. So we're starting with talking about FY18 actual results. And specifically on this slide, we're talking about the drivers of our 2.6 net patient revenue shortage. So the first thing is surgical utilization being under budget. We did have uh, actually a number of things that occurred over a short amount of time uh, with providers at our hospital. So uh, the first one that I'll talk about is our dental surgeon had uh, a pretty serious medical issue and had to retire. He was, uh, I believe, our one pediatric dental surgeon in the state and will be sorely missed, um, was, a, was an outstanding surgeon and just a, a tremendous person, uh, but he had to retire. We don't have it on here, but this relates to our expense uh, as well. We had a 0 0.6 anesthesiologist that almost died riding his mountain bike with his son um, uh, in late fall of last year, and as a result, uh, he had to retire, and we had to backfill um, that point six with temporary folks, which, of course, uh, inflated our budget uh, as far as expenses are concerned. And then the one I think that most people are very aware of, uh, this is out in the public, is uh, one of our lead orthopedic surgeons uh, having leukemia. Uh, and that, that was essentially the last quarter really affected our FY18. We'll talk more about uh, the gap that that has caused uh, for FY19. And it's very significant. I think you'll be surprised to, to hear our estimated uh, numbers as far as patient revenue is concerned. So inpatient admissions being under budget uh, as a result of what I just talked about. Uh, understandably, we have had less uh, surgical admissions and our average length of stay has decreased uh, to 2.6 days. Now this from a revenue, net patient revenue standpoint is certainly uh, something that I don't like to see, uh, but from a standpoint of providing the right care at the right time to our patients, it's actually a good news story. And what I'm talking about there is Many of our cases now are going down to one day overnight, staying at our, our hospital, where before they may have been two, day, two nights or three nights. So our total hips, our total knees, our total shoulders, for the most part, patients stay one night and go home the next day which is a good thing. We've actually done partial uh, knee replacements. So you have total knee replacements and then you have partial knee replacements. And we're sending some of our patients with partial knee replacements home the same day. And in the future, I think you've probably heard our surgeons talk about this briefly when they came and presented earlier this year. We're looking at same day uh, total implant surgeries going home which is the way that we want to go and the right thing for our patients if the patient is you know the right patient for that of course then emergency room visits under budget by 4.4 percent 
I, another good news, bad news story. Bad news as far as a CEO wanting to make sure you can make budget. Good news as far as providing the right care to our patients. So we've had a case manager in our ED. It's a co-funded position with our FQHC across the street. Uh, this person uh, has been in place, two different people, has been in place for over two years now. We have assigned uh, hundreds of PCMs to patients coming into the ED. So a patient comes into the ED, do you have a PCM, patient care manager? Do you have a primary care manager? No, I don't. Can we assign you one? And so what does that do? Well, instead of coming into the ED, the patient makes an appointment with their primary care manager and gets the care that they need, right place, right time. And then, and then our sleep study closed in January. We had a great relationship with North Country in their sleep fellowship trained physician, but they had too much workload up in their area to continue to support us. And so we had to shut down our sleep study program, but we'll talk a little bit more about standing that up again at Copley in a further slide. All right, just a quick question on this slide. Um, you're down 1.8 million in your NPR in total. Do you know, and you can get back to me if you don't, do you know how much in dollars roughly each of these are? You know, is the surgical utilization 800,000, a million, and? Yeah. I can tell you the sleep study was five to 600,000 dollars worth of net revenue. That one I know off of my head. Um, the others, I, I haven't really done the number crunching. Um, in terms of the impact on FY18 specifically, our orthopedic surgeon who is now out on medical leave, which he was attributed to generating five million in net revenue for us a year, which is a size that is certainly a major producer for our department or for our hospital. So, um, you can get back to me, yeah. you know, just in perspective, yeah, because I didn't know if this was in the right order, you know, so if the sleep study is five or six hundred, right. you know, some of the others might be smaller, all contributing yeah, for yeah. sure. But okay, thanks. Yep. Okay, so this is a, a rather busy slide, so let me talk you through it. So we just talked about net patient reg revenue budget at 1.8 million uh, for FY18, and then we had, as far as our operating expenses, we were 390,000 over budget for FY18, which equals 2.2 million total in operating loss. So we have three challenged areas. I don't think that this is a surprise uh, to the board. I think you've probably been hearing about this all week from other hospitals, but I'll talk briefly about it. So labor cost, um, we were 480,000 or 1.2% over budget. And the biggest of these, of course, was the need for travelers. So the, the last few fiscal years, we definitely uh, set stretch goals for filling our vacant uh, positions, and we didn't quite meet the mark. And as a result, we were over budget because we, we needed to fill those positions with somebody, and without permanent people, we filled them with travelers. As we know, it's usually double the cost, if not higher, to bring in a temporary person. For drug cost, 590K, or 22.6% uh, over budget. <laughs> I don't even know how to talk about that one, quite frankly. I, I'm allergic to bees, so I need an EpiPen. And to make an EpiPen that costs hundreds of dollars, and, and if I don't have it, I literally will die, is just ridiculous. And I know at the state level, um, at the federal level, uh, a lot of people are looking at this, and this is a big monster. Uh, probably too big for us, uh, but it's pretty darn frustrating when you see numbers like that, uh, when you see an increase in on oncology utilization for patients that are coming to us that have cancer, and because of drug shortages, they jack up the price to double digit so people can make billions of dollars or organizations can make billions of dollars is just ridiculous. So enough on that. I'll get off my high horse. Please excuse me. Uh, 317K over budget for supply cost. So this one is, uh, you know, is, is unique in, in the sense of 
the demand for orthopedic implants. And we've had discussions about this previously here. We've had discussions at our hospital about the usage of different types of implants and which ones are the best and are you getting the best value for the specific implant that you're using. So as I was swimming laps this morning, I do some of my best thinking, and uh, which isn't very great thinking, but it's my best, so I'll go with that, um, is, is the custom implant is definitely more expensive. Now, we have brought those prices down, maybe not to the level that we want to get to long term, but we definitely have brought them down. And how you do that is you get your surgeons on board. And our surgeons are very dedicated to the success of our hospital. You've seen two of them recently that are bought in and want to do the right thing and really care about what our patients are having to pay for the surgeries that they're really proud of being able to provide. However, the custom implant that that we're doing is based off of the, the uh, anatomy of the patient. So we take a CT scan of your knee, a picture of your knee, and then we make an implant that matches the anatomy of your, your knee structure. And that's what goes in. So if I'm going to get my knee replacement, which I hope never happens, and they say you can have an off-the-shelf knee that anybody gets that has your dimensions, or we can give you a knee that's pretty similar, if not almost exact, to the knee that we're taking out. Which one do you want, Art? And I'll ask all of you, which one would you want? I can tell you the one that I would want is the custom knee. Um, and we can get into prices and all that all day long, but from that standpoint, uh, it means something. And so do we have to continue to push prices down? We absolutely do. But is there something to be said about a custom implant? I think so. All right, on that side, can you just talk a little bit about the savings? Because those total about a million four over in expense categories, and you were over budget by about 400000 So you must have had about a million dollars in savings, um, you know, some of it may be volume related, but are there specific cost saving programs you guys put through? Well, the savings art was referring to previously. Thank you. The savings art was referring to related to the custom implant happened um, in this particular fiscal year. The majority of it was about uh, $400,000. Um, we just were able to get our surgeons to really help in the, at the negotiating table um, with that particular vendor to bring the pricing down. Um, and I think having their buy-in and their participation in that process was really what helped make us successful because we don't have a significant enough volume to really have a lot of leverage over these large vendors. Um, as a small critical access hospital, we do we do a fair number of joints for the size hospital that we are, for sure. But you know. Yeah, I Up against that, these nas national companies, we're I kind of a drop the in the bucket. I think the point was trying to make in that in this particular fiscal year, um, your operating spent expenses were over by 390 and you yes. have this yes. large list. And when you net those out, there there's a million dollar difference. And she's wondering yes. where there are some areas of strong savings. Yeah, yeah and, the, and these numbers are net of those savings. So... $400,000 on the implant side, mm -hmm. and then 170 on the drug side with our participation in 340B and an expansion of that program. Um, and, and the numbers that you're seeing here are net of those of those efforts. And yeah, on the drug side, utilization definitely has played a part in the, the growth in oncology. I, I guess yeah. the point, though, is yes. that these are the net numbers in those particular categories, but yeah. there had to have been other categories where you saw... Oh, absolutely. Savings. Yeah, that's what I'm I meant. following. There has you. To be okay. Million yes, the bucket that's about. not shown on here. <laughs> absolutely. So yes, we did have about a million in other other savings. Other costs went down a million, and we've had great um, health insurance experience in this particular year. So our benefits were lower. Um, we're not going to see that continue, which I'll talk about. Um, and also, we, uh, toward the latter portion of the year, I think the summer of 2018, 
um, implemented some additional cost control measures, which we're going to talk about on the next slide, um, that I think really helped us contain those costs related to mostly education and travel and, and dues and purchase services and some of that discretionary funding that we have a lot, we have much more control over. Um, and also our depreciation costs going down significantly because we've curtailed our capital spending since we're in uh, the financial situation that we're in, which we'll be talking about further as well. Okay, so yeah, that's we go to the next slide, you might, right. yeah, you might hear more you about have those a million of positive news in there, Absolutely. too. So it's good to yeah. be able to say what you're doing Absolutely. as well that might be cost savings or things that just happen, like healthcare utilization, things like that. Yes, which will be our next slide. Yeah. No. Thank you. So Debbie just talked about some of the cost savings that we had in FY18 and uh, continue in FY19. So I've talked about some of these previously, but they continue and, and really a number of these actions I think always should be in place. And so I'll talk briefly about a few of them. So. Since we've been feeling this crunch of not being able to meet budget for both expenses and revenue, uh, particularly in FY18 was a tough year, as we all just saw, uh, we have uh, different measures in place. So no position at our hospital just gets backfilled. And uh, when I first got to Copley and at every place that I've been, you get this, well, I need this position really, really bad. And my answer is prove it. And so we actually have the directors of the area of uh, backfill in new positions come to this committee, which is made up of the senior team, and they justify why they need the position. Now, do we approve a majority of them? Well, a lot of them come in their no-brainers, right? And that's particularly the clinical ones. But have we denied either in budget preparation or throughout the year? Uh, FTEs, many. We, we have said, no, we're, we're not going to backfill this position. My board uh, has been concerned that, um, that there's not a lot of fat left with this process and that I may be uh, preventing key positions to be filled. But I think that w our analysis um, through this process has been solid and that we are not degrading safety or the level of care that we're providing. As I said, most of these positions are non-clinical and somebody else just has to step up and get the job done. So we have been freezing our capital purchases, education and travel to a certain degree. Uh, these uh, come up through the senior leader, oftentimes up to me. I'm, I'm typically not that draconian in how I do business, but when your budget uh, is what it has been in FY18, you have to take uh, draconian measures to, to try to meet your budget. Uh, quick note, we, we have done really well on our expenses for FY19. It, it, uh, we are, and you would say, well, you probably should because you're under budget for your revenue. However, uh, we all know in a small hospital, your fixed costs are the majority of the expenses costs that you have at your hospital. So we are under budget on expenses, and I think a lot of the reason is because of the measures that we're taking to manage the business of healthcare. So we all know at Copley, the, the heartbeat of what goes on in our hospital is our surgical center. And what we do in our surgical center affects most areas uh, in our, our hospital outside of the surgical center. So the, the, probably the most important thing that we've done in order to try to bridge that $5 million net patient revenue gap as a result of our orthopedic surgeon being out, and we expect uh, him to be out all of FY19. Uh, best case scenario, maybe end of FY19 or early FY20. Again, that is $5 million in net patient revenue that an orthopedic surgeon busy as him or Brian Eros, who you met, or uh, John Macy, who you met, is a real number. 
And so we started this budget season knowing that we already had a $5 million gap for FY19. And I want to highlight to the board and to the, the folks here that this team, um, just amazing work that they have done. We're not going to bridge that gap, though, of $5 million. We're not. And, and, and I'm just going to jump right to it. And that's why I know we have a May time frame is our deadline for asking for a rate increase. But we're strongly considering that. And the reason why we're not, we're not bringing it up now just because you asked us to come in, but we seriously were trying to bridge that gap. And Kevin, you remember some of those uh, months where I told you we met budget? We did. Um, but we had also a couple months where we were three and 400,000 under budget for revenue. And Kevin, if you remember, I emailed you for February initially and said we were 100,000 over budget for gross revenue. But when the net revenue came to us, that for, for February, we were 300,000 plus under budget for revenue. So what's happening to us along with having this $5 million gap is we're having a shift in our payer mix. And the shift in our payer mix is going from commercial, Deb, correct me if I'm wrong, to Medicare. And that shift may be two or 3% and you might think, well, that doesn't sound like a lot. But when your reimbursement goes from 80% to 50% for all of these cases that we're doing in our surgical center, that's a huge amount of money. And that's why you're seeing for February our gross, us meeting budget, but when we get the results a couple weeks later for actual net patient revenue net, we're under budget significantly. And so we're, we're, we're doing the work. Um, it's, it's something that we've seen at other hospitals for some time, and now we're starting to see it at Copley. While we're on that subject, you know, we've seen that uh, gradual uh, movement away from commercial to government. But on the, and I know we've asked this question in the past, I'm just curious if anything else has come to light since the last time we asked it. But during the uh, household survey, Lamoille was the county that came up with the uh, largest number of uh, uninsured. And I'm curious if you have any, any more enlightenment on that, if you think it's just bad data, and also what's happening with your, your free care and bad debt. Deb, do you want to try that one? So, thank you. I keep forgetting to move the microphone. Okay, Thanks. Um, uh, that Lamoille County survey, I think we, we met uh, last month and sort of talked about our reaction to that. It, it, it doesn't it doesn't seem um, accurate in terms of the things that that I'm that I'm seeing come through, you know, our financial counseling office. And we have seen an increase in bad debt and charity, certainly year to date in February. Um, it went up to 2.5 percent of our gross revenue. We budgeted 2 percent, which is around what it's been uh, the last couple of years. And I think it's fairly common this particular time of year, early in the calendar year, uh, for bad debt and charity to go up because that's when new deductibles uh, are usually due and folks are, are finding it challenging to meet those high deductible obligations that some of them have. So it's not uncommon to see that increase this particular time of year. I'm not certain that that's going to be a trend that we're going to expect to see for the remainder of the year, but we're going to watch it. Uh, but, but I haven't seen an uptick so drastic in our bad debt and charity that would that would validate the result of that survey the information just didn't it didn't feel right to me not being involved in the survey I, I can't say if it's accurate or not I, I no I can't really speak to that it just but seems so didn't smell right that just one little section of the state would be yeah so different than every other I don't I don't really see us as being that much of an outlier based on on what's coming through our door and what we're processing for bad debt and charity applications but okay. yeah so we'll hop to the next slide. You asked us to provide an update on the FY19 financial performance and Art covered, Art stole my thunder. Sorry. That's okay. <laughs> it's okay. Uh, so our net revenue year to date is down by 4.9%, which is up 1.8% from the previous year this time. 
Uh, we've already talked about the orthopedic surgeon who's on a medical leave who will be out for the full year. Um, and Art mentioned that, that was a, that's a $5 million net revenue impact that from our efforts in the surgical suite and changes that we're making in that area to the, to the block schedule, to the way our other surgeons have really amazingly stepped up, um, done some cross-training to new specialties. Uh, we've really been able to offset some of that $5 million loss in, re in net revenue with those efforts. Um, but we are unlikely to fill that entire gap by the end of the year. And so we're forecasting that it's, it's likely will be about 2.8% under our net revenue um, budget by the end of the year. We're, hope we're hopeful that can turn around, um, but I think this is a realistic projection of being under by 2.8. Um, the trend in our pair mix shift uh, might also have to do with the... Um, loss of that surgeon and the, the shifting that we're doing in our surgical suite and the mix of services that, that we're providing um, can have an impact on um, our payer mix. And so we are seeing a rather sizable shift from Medicare to commercial. Um, our Medicare made up 36% of our business in, in prior years and also in our budget. Uh, and year to date, we're seeing that up to 41%, which is a pretty significant increase, having a large impact on our overall reimbursement rate for the business that we are doing. Um, again, hoping to see some of that change through the rest of the course of this year. I don't, I don't see that as being a permanent trend, but that's what year to date the actuals are. Um, on the expense side, our expenses are under budget by 1.9%, essentially flat from the prior year. I think that's attributable, attributable to the cost control measures that we put in place, the um, hiring action committee and the freeze on capital spending and the freeze on um, education and travel. And um, while those efforts, I think, have been somewhat successful in containing our costs during this year, I don't see a lot of those as being long-term permanent changes that we're going to make in the organization. There are more stopgap measures given the financial situation that we find ourselves in. We do need to continue to earn a margin and, and invest in our professional development of our staff, um, invest in infrastructure. Uh, we're currently actively involved right now in coming up with uh, more current projections as a part of our FY20 budget process. Um, and after we go through that process, which is a very bottom-up process with all the leaders in our organization, uh, we'll have a better sense of what of those um, cost savings efforts that we've made to date will be permanent and, and what might need to uh, come back up and what, are the, what things we might need to invest in that we haven't been investing in um, simply because our cash position is low. Um, drugs and, and implant costs continue to be a challenge year to date. Those costs are still uh, giving us a hard time. Implants are up 6%. We have some um, toe in the water with uh, the Dartmouth Alliance, and I'll let you talk about that in a little bit more detail in a moment. Um, and so we're taking some steps to try to address some of these supply chain challenges, um, and I'll let Art explain that. Um, in addition, year to date, I alluded to it earlier, we're seeing a very unfavorable health insurance experience. We've been very fortunate the last couple of years, I don't know if you recall, that's been on our cost savings list um, through our, in our budget, but uh, this year we've had some, some poor claims experience and we're expecting a, a sizable double digit increase in, in health insurance this year. Um, Good news, we've been having some success on contracted labor, however. So that's down 2.5 FTEs year to date, uh, about $250,000 under budget. Uh, so some of the efforts that we've been putting into place with building, growing from within and growing our own and working with the school systems uh, seems to be making a difference. So that's fantastic news. Um, putting that all together, we're, we're projecting an operating loss of, of 1.4 million or 2.1% by the end of the year. That's our, our fourth year in a row of generating an operating loss. We're monitoring our financial system, our financial position very closely and um, like I said, refining our projections um, with March's actuals, which you'll have soon, which we'll have soon and then you'll have them soon. Um, that'll kind of lock in where we think our projections will, will land. Um, a little bit more and that analysis will end up determining whether or not we'll be back very soon for a mid-year rate request. It kind of depends on how much of that gap, you know, we feel like we can really be successful in this year and um, 
needing to secure that, that financial health and, and really need a year where we're generating a margin. Um, and do you have a perspective on what your total margin um, is looking at for the year? Uh, not far off from this 2.1. We don't have a lot of non-operating revenue in the, in, the, in the mix. I think 2%, I think is what it was. Okay. Yeah. In years past, there'd been a difference because we were fundraising for a capital campaign. But, um, so you asked us to share our thoughts on what our position would be on whether or not Copley should um, have their net revenue rebased to a lower amount to reflect these these trends. I sort of see three um, three facets to that decision making process from my perspective. Uh, one being, was, was that FY19 budget realistic in the first place? Another being, well, you know, what are your financial needs? What's your financial health? What's your position right now? Um, and the third being, you know, ha have you been over budget a lot in the past and, and, and need an adjustment from that perspective as well? So in terms of FY19's budget being realistic, I, I truly believe it was a realistic and attainable revenue number. Um, I think we just had too many unique circumstances hitting all in this in this one year that are um, things that aren't able to be predicted, one-time events of you know medical leaves that are significant that that we weren't able to predict. I, I truly believe had Dr. Huber not um, had to leave us you know for this year, we we may have surpassed the budget that we put um, on the books um, or that you guys approved. Um, I think there were things sort of out of our control that are one-time things that I don't expect to be permanent. I think in the next year, we should be able to recover, have medical staff back in place um, to address where we had those medical staff shortages, to include sleep study as well that we're also trying to bring back. Um, in terms of our financial health, I think it's pretty obvious <laughs> that uh, we definitely need to generate an operating margin this next year. We need to do the best that we can do to do that. And we've got um, significant efforts that we've been making on cost control. Um, and we'll have much more detail to share with that with our um, FY19 projections and FY20 budget submission. Um, I think if we were to rebase our net revenue lower, as a result of these unique circumstances that we're under. I think it would compromise our ability next year um, to make up enough of that uh, in order to generate an operating margin. And historically, if you look back at three years, there's been ups and there's been downs. Um, if you take a look at those three years, we're pretty much right on budget and in compliance you know, with, with our net revenue budget. While sustaining an 11% decrease to our rates, where the, the system during this period of time has gone up 8% in their rates. Um, I think that shows that we're on budget and, and should, should proceed as was planned and as was approved um, during our FY19 um, budget submission. So I don't recommend that Copley be considered for a rebase for net revenue based on these, this argument. And I'll turn it over to Art because I think I think you'd like to hear about our supply chain. Before I get into that, I just want to back up and and let the board know and uh, everybody here in the room the work that we actually did for preparing for our FY19 budget because I think it's important to understand we do not put our budget together in a vacuum. Uh, but the way I've been taught when I was a young lieutenant in the Army at a hospital is you include the people that are running the business in each of the departments. So we count on our department leaders, our department directors throughout the hospital to submit what they think their budget should be for their piece of the pie, if you will. And then that's what Debbie's talking about when she says it's bottom up. And that's the way it should be. We hold them accountable for managing their budgets throughout the year. They set their budget, we question it, it, we validate it, we approve it, we bring it to you, you approve it, and then we expect them to manage it appropriately. That, in my opinion, is the right way to run the budget. As I talked about previously, however, the, the heartbeat at Copley as far as utilization, productivity, uh, revenue being produced starts in our surgical center. So I wanted to make sure that for FY19, 
that we got that right. And we got together with our outpatient practice director, our financial folks, Deb Rasool, our COO, and then our surgical center director last year at about this time, and we went through exactly how many surgeries were going to be conducted by surgical minutes per day. So Brian Eros does a total knee, for example. His average for a total knee historically is 90 minutes. He's gonna be in OR1 on Monday, and he's got so many minutes in that OR throughout the day. So how many cases can he do in OR1 on that Monday, adding the average of what it takes to do each case along with turnover time? I mean, it's simple math, but we literally, by physician, by surgeon, did that for our surgical center and then also our outpatient uh, procedure room. And we pushed a lot of our cases to our outpatient procedure room that didn't need to be in the OR to maximize our three ORs. What our staff look at now is those four rooms in our surgical center, the minutes are like gold because our patients are waiting months to get in to get their surgeries and we should treat those minutes like gold for our patients because it's about getting them in, getting them healthy, and getting them back to doing what they want to do. So I feel confident that we set that budget up uh, quite well. And as Debbie talked about, we just had some circumstances that, you, that, that life brings, unfortunately. And the team has done well. So what we did after we found out Dr. Huber had leukemia and we knew about this budget uh, gap of $5 million, we brought all of the surgeons into the room and they were all around the room. Uh, they, know, they knew what was occurring. We talked about at that time with Rasul's help, he presented to them our gap and we asked them what more could they do uh, for surgeries, for outpatient uh, visits, et cetera. And they have s stepped up tremendously. We actually every Monday look at the previous week what was done in our surgical center and our outpatient uh, procedure room by minutes. So we're actually looking to see if each surgeon is meeting their minutes by week per the budget. And most of them have been far surpassing the, the budgeted minutes that have been set because they're stepping up. But there's always a cause and effect for everything you do. So if Brian Arrows, for example, is doing an extra day of surgery, which he often is, what happens? Well, he's doing, an, he's doing one less day of outpatient visits. And if you're not seeing patients that think they have a knee problem, then you never get patients in to get surgeries done. And so there's a give and take um, that certainly is occurring. What we did there is we brought on temporarily a fellowship trained sports medicine physician to help with some of the outpatient visits. Um, but that's a reason why you'd see our outpatient visits are down for orthopedics because they're in the OR more. And so it, it's not a simple equation um, but I think we're maximizing what we have at this time. So moving on to next steps. So what we're trying to do uh, about the future. And I can tell you unequivocally that we've put a lot of thought into this, but I can't give you something concrete at this point in time. But what I can tell you is we have looked very closely at the New England Alliance for Health, which is formerly the Dartmouth Alliance. And uh, we've had a lot of interaction with Dartmouth over the last year, particularly in telemedicine. They have a very strong telemedicine program. Uh, for example, I, I was told yesterday or the day before we saw uh, nine pulmon uh, pulmonology patients at Copley uh, via a uh, a Dartmouth Hitchcock a pulmonologist. Um, so we feel good about the relationship that we have with them in that area. And so we looked at this alliance. Basically, it's a purchasing alliance. And half of the hospitals in Vermont are part of it. A lot of, obviously, all of Dartmouth Hitchcock system uh, hospitals are part of it. And 
it's not only for supplies, it's for pharmaceuticals, it's for insurance, uh, it's for education, and for other things. And what we're looking at right now is ensuring that the preliminary numbers that they gave us, which I can tell you are well into the six digits for savings for fiscal year, are actually real numbers. We want to make sure that we're not double counting. And the big thing that I want to make sure is what are we really looking at when we're talking about supplies? So are they assuming, for example, that we're just going to move all of our implants to the implants that they use? Because that would be a bad assumption because that's not how you do it year one. Because if you don't include your surgeons and say we want to move from X to Y implant, if you don't do that without their input, um, the CEO probably won't last very long at the hospital because that's just not the right way to collaboratively work together as a team. But what we're seeing is something that's very, uh, Deb say not to say very, so it's favorable. <laughs> I can say that. In, in, in the, yet to be determined yet, how favorable. How favorable. And so that's not everything, but that's, that's one thing that we're strongly looking at. Um, cl clearly there is a cost associated with that to be to be part of that system and we want to make sure that it really gives us uh, good value um, for our hospital but for me I, I think that the, the, it's very likely that we will become part of that alliance again it it's not going to solve all the problems uh, of the world of Copley but you've asked me before about buying groups and it actually sparked my interest and we through our relationship with Dartmouth started the discussion they have been outstanding through this process uh, very upfront and visible and uh, I feel pretty positive about the gains that we can have with that and now year one could be X amount of savings right year two could increase exponentially once you get surgeons on board uh, to say use 50% of the implants through the alliance and year three could even be more. Maybe not, but this is not a one year only savings. This is how can we slowly shift over and we probably would never shift completely because we like the custom implant and it's a reason why our patients come to our hospital. But I certainly can see uh, I'll just leave you with this. I sat there with Brian Arrows, who you've met, and we were looking at, in a meeting, the cost per implant. And he said to me that this is embarrassing, the cost that we're seeing. And he knows as well as anybody what those costs are because he cares about that, as I said previously. And so our surgeons are bought in to a certain degree as long as they don't feel it affects the clinical high quality care that we provide to really consider other products. So when I first got here, we were using maybe two implants. Now they're trying multiple implants of different types, trialing them to see if this is any better than the other. And if it is, well, can you give us a deal? Cut $1,000 cut off and we'll consider using it. Because they really are bought in, as you saw with the, the two that came two months ago, uh, to, to the viability of our hospital. So in closing, again, I wanna thank you for uh, letting us come here today uh, to talk with you. Uh, it, it seems like over the last uh, several months, uh, I've finally gotten to a pretty decent place with all of you, and then I up and decide to leave. So I apologize about that. I, I know that um, we're, regardless if I stayed, we're not always going to agree, and we can, we'll probably, Jessica, agree to disagree in a few minutes when you ask your question, and that's okay. Um, I can't probably swim with you, so I'll just have to take it. Um, but I, I appreciate the work that you're doing in, in the, the, the collaboration um, and, and the better teamwork that I've certainly seen over the last uh, many months, um, probably you know since the last presentation that we did in August. So thank you for that. And again, I want to close by saying 
I think we've done a pretty good job at bridging the gap to a certain degree. If the, the gap that we have because of the things we talked about is 100 yards, maybe we got, we got to 60 yards of it. Um, but I think if there's ever a time, and I haven't asked for this previously, for the board to consider if Deb and I decide to bring it to you, if there's ever a time to allow us to have a moderate rate increase, I think this is the time. Thank you. Thank you, Art. I don't, you know, I, I for one, uh, want to commend the Copley family because I think that everybody has come together in what really was a perfect storm of obstacles that yeah. you've had to deal with. And, yeah. uh, um, you know, I think that uh, um, we were very, very fortunate that Deb was there. Um, Yes. You no, know, that could have been a, uh, a real tragedy there. Yes. Unfortunately, Rasul had the foresight to make sure that the right people were in place, too. So um, even in his death, we owe him thanks. But one of the things that immediately comes to mind, Art, is, and, and again, before I ask my first question, I, I do want to say that um, I really appreciated your monthly updates and um, after November, I was surprised that we're as good as we are at today. Um, so, yeah. you know, that just shows how much hard work people are putting in up there to yeah. uh, make this all come together. Um, Thank you. But I would be remiss, given this opportunity, if I didn't ask you if you could update us on any um, recent events in the secession planning, knowing that you're leaving. and. If you have a date when, for sure when you will be gone and who will be the art that I'll be talking to each month? Sure. Um, so, geez, I, I got a little close to the microphone. Sorry. I always use my outdoor voice, which causes problems at times. So it's it, right now uh, the, the date on the wall is uh, the, the 30th of 31st of May is my last day. I'll be starting with Memorial Main Health on June 3rd. Um, and so what the, the board has done a, a very good job, um, and, and I've worked with them. And uh, Vera, our, our chief operating officer, who some of you uh, know, has been part of it uh, to bring in a temporary person um, from uh, Helms and Company. Uh, some of you may know him. His name is uh, Jeff White. Um, he's, uh, he, he has an immense amount of experience uh, running uh, parts of hospitals and being a temporary CEO or interim CEO at, I think this would be his eighth time uh, being an interim CEO, mostly in New Hampshire, uh, but Vera, our chief operating officer, worked with him back in her uh, CVMC days. And because of that connection, uh, she called him and asked him if he would consider, and he essentially said, anything for you, Vera. And, uh, and so we've already locked in that contract for as long as, it, as he needs to be with Copley. He actually some of you in here may remember before Mel, there was a gap of time of almost a year, and he was the interim CEO at Copley before Mel came aboard. Actually, Debbie knows him. And, 2006, 2007. And has, has worked with him in the discussion uh, that Rasul and I had, be, just talking about the past and me learning about it, was that he, Rasul, felt that he did a very good job as an interim at, at Copley. And if you know Rasul coming from him, if he thinks you did a good job, you probably did a good job. And then uh, we have a search committee, which is made up of uh, people from the board, uh, senior leaders at the hospital, other staff at the hospital, recently met uh, and interviewed one search company. And I think they have another search company in the near future. They'll make a decision on that, and then they'll be doing a national search for Copley's next permanent CEO. Okay. Who's the chair of your board now? Uh, Carl Schlehechta. Okay. And yeah. Are you convinced that the, the board is fully tuned in in this transition period? Absolutely. Okay. Fully tuned in. Okay. Um, a week or two ago, we had a panel um, that member Robin Munch put together, um, which was an excellent uh, look at uh, 
the circumstances that rural hospitals are facing across the country. And Eric Schell from Stroudwater talked about um, what he believed was a key strategy for rural hospitals to succeed was to move away from the fee-for-service world into right. um, the value-based world. And he had some quotes from people in Washington talking about how five years from now fee-for-service might be dead. And um, I'm just curious if uh, there's been any more movement by Copley to take a look, because you've been one of the institutions that really has dragged your feet as far as yeah. having an interest in uh, yeah. joining. So we dragged our feet for, for a very good reason. And I'm, I, I figured this question would come up, and, and I wanted to publicly uh, briefly talk about that. And the reason is dollars, quite frankly. So the current uh, structure uh, with OneCare is not conducive to a hospital that does not also have primary care. And so I worked closely with OneCare last year on their model. And essentially, unless it changes, the model puts all the risk on Copley. And we have influence with the FQHC, but we don't have control because they're a separate entity with a separate CEO and leadership team. And the number essentially, worst case scenario, is $400,000 loss. And so if I don't have control of primary care, and the FQHC is not willing to go in equally with me, in other words, having financial skin in the game, my board will not approve it, and I don't blame them for not approving it, because $400,000 when primary care does not have any risk at all because they're a separate organization, it makes it really difficult. With that being said, I've already been in, in touch with um, OneCare's chief operating officer and also the, the new CEO at the FQHC to start talking about what we can do together. I don't blame the FQHC last year for making the decision that they made. They were between CEOs at that time between a CFO at that time. So let me make that clear. That was, I would have made the decision they made to say, all right, we, we can't go in equally. And what I mean having skin in the game is there, a few of their board members asked me last July, August, well, what are you going to do? And I said, I'll go risk for Medicaid if you share that $400,000 risk with me, 200 to Copley, 200 to the FQHC, and understandably, they just were not in a position. This year, that could be different. I just want to, I just took the mic for a quick second, because this is actually the, the heart of my question, and it builds on Kevin's question with, you know, we, we did hear from Eric Schell from Stradwater, who had, you know, he's got experience, national expert on rural hospitals across the country, lots of uh, connections into Washington, and again, the word we're hearing is fee for service is dead at the federal level in the next five years, and yeah. certainly the state is moving towards value-based payment, fixed payment. And one of the things that you know he predicted was the hospitals that are going to be the most vulnerable are the independent standalone hospitals that don't have any connection to primary care um, and are relying heavily on, in particular, one specialty mm -hmm. to generate that fee for service. In fact, I think he mentioned orthopedics. Mm -hmm. as a, a common revenue generator. So when I think about our hospitals, I think I have worry for a Copley in that sense because yeah. I think about, you know, many other hospitals have owned some primary care in their communities. Um, they are less uh, reliant on the specialty and they have some affiliations, partnerships with either UAM right. or, or Dartmouth in the state. And so in fact, their way forward, according to this expert, was affiliate or partner or create some relationships. Right. So I was really excited to hear about the Dartmouth conversations you're having around the yeah. purchasing, because I think that's really, really helpful. But also, you know, the, the sentiment is the revenue is going to start coming through primary care. Right. So the rural hospitals that can align with primary care are going to be the ones that are going to be, as we go forward, the successful ones and those that are completely disconnected from primary care are going to be in vulnerable position. Yes. So I guess I'm sort of just adding on to a little bit what you're saying, and I'd love for you to just talk a little bit more about that. I mean, sure. Because I think it was very uh, convincing that the way forward is to align with primary care and to think about partnerships, affiliations, think shared services, benefiting from economies of scale with, with other institutions. So. Sure, I'd, I'd be happy to speak briefly on that. 
I think that uh, Jessica, you and Robin were probably, Rob, how long have you been here? Over four years on the board, each of you? Uh, I'm coming up on three years, I think, this fall. Okay, maybe you just came on board when I was speaking the first time. Yeah. I, I, I wasn't there in this capacity, but we're in the old location, the, the smaller room, and Jess is the dean. She just is one. <laughs> That's right. And uh, Al, Al Gobey was the chair then. And somebody brought up, and I was brand new as CEO, and somebody brought up and they called us a system. And I couldn't bite my tongue. And I stood up and said, we are not a system. We are not a system until we are all under the same financial umbrella, is what I said at that time. And I still stand by that today. Now, whether that will happen with Copley uh, anytime in the future, um, it, it's, it's certainly, I, I'd be lying if I didn't say we haven't talked about it. I'd be lying if I said I haven't uh, sat down and had lunch with John Brumstead. That's my job, to look at every option. But we certainly are not intending to uh, at this point in time, but it's my job, as I've told the board, to look at every option. Uh, regardless of how the hospital's doing. W with that being said, there's a reason why Memorial Hospital looked very enticing to me when they offered me the position there, because their strength there is primary care. So the first thing they want me to do when I go there is bring in a couple new primary care physicians because, as I told you, they lost two high producers. And I agree with you uh, with that. Um, I'm a person that spent most of my career in a system. And in systems, you do give up autonomy. Where I'm going, I'm losing autonomy and my ability to make decisions on, on a dime. Um, I will lead more with influence and have a, a ton of dotted lines to me on the org chart and not so many solid lines. Um, but I believe that's where we're going, not just in Vermont, but throughout the country, because you're seeing more and more, you just watched the Sunday morning news a couple weeks ago and talked about a hospital in Missouri that shut, shut its doors because it was independent and it didn't have that support. So what happens is you lose that, some autonomy, but I think what you gain is very strong in the strength of the leverage that a Dartmouth Alliance has. Um, so that's one thing. But as far as primary care, I cut my teeth in my early days when I didn't even have to shave every day in the Army because we, we focus on primary care very well in the military health system because the age of our population, the most people are what? Between 18 and 25. So they don't need a whole lot of specialty care. They need a lot of primary care. And then we we always felt like primary care is what saves the dollars for the more expensive care that you're avoiding. And we've been doing that for 15 years, 20 years in, in the Army system. The other piece with primary care that I think we really have to focus on above and beyond the retention and the recruitment piece, we don't focus enough on ATC, which is access to care. So it's, it's getting the, the patients in within a day if they have an urgent need. Not an emergent need, but an urgent need. And I think that that's where it all is based, and I've always thought that. And I think we're actually a little bit behind the times. Well, thank you, and I um, I want to give the phone back to Kevin. Phone, <laughs> microphone, <laughs> microphone back to Kevin. But I do want to just tell you that I um, and I'm sincere in this. I'm going to miss you, Art. Oh. I very much appreciate wow. all that you have done, and um, I think you've taken the property forward. And I think I, I really appreciate the cost containment efforts that you're trying to uh, undertake, and and the vision that you have for. How copy might move forward. And Thank you. Sincere in that, I will miss you. I miss and you I too. See you some uh, open water swimming race. I'd love to crush you. Not, <laughs> not going to happen. I know, but my money's on Jeff. <laughs> You're on. You're on. All right. Bring it. You know, we had to have a little bit of that back and forth. Yeah, so. a little bit of <laughs> okay. Other questions from board members, Tom. So. Um, a lot of my questions have already been answered in terms of the, uh, uh, you know, Kevin raised the issue about um, the number of uninsured in Lamoille County, and I, I had this morning looked at the unemployment rate in, in Lamoille County, which is the second highest in the state, at three and a half percent. So 
my thinking was in line with that, and Maureen, as always, kind of hit, hit two or three of the questions that I was thinking about asking and uh, saved the time there. I'd like to probe a little bit more um, on the payer mix issue um, because I went back to uh, your uh, 2018 um, projected, uh, um, and you could see the deterioration uh, relative to the 2018 budget then, um, and then it deteriorated a little bit more in, uh, down toward the actuals. And uh, Copley has, uh, with UVM Medical Center, the highest ratio of commercial in your payer mix um, by a, quite, you know, quite a healthy margin. And your 2019 uh, projection for commercial over the 2018 uh, projected was an 11.3% increase or $4.5 million. So when, so it seemed to me that, you know, just statistically that you're at the, um, <clears throat> the, the edges of, of risk there in terms of dependence on, on, on the commercial rate. So my question is how, how is the fact that Medicare is picking up some of this gap, um, is that just happenstance or is that something that you're managing to? I would say it's a factor of the service mix and the changes that we're, that we're forced to make essentially with the loss of um, our orthopedic surgeon who did, who did knees and, uh, and hips. We're making up for some of his OR time with other types of cases um, that maybe aren't bringing in the same um, group of patients. I'd say that's the, the biggest factor is our it's our Paris, our our service mix. It's the services that we're providing that are that are driving that. And there's been such significant change in that area just this year, um, with us sort of reshuffling um, the way the playbook looks. So what I hear you saying is that there is a demand for your services out there across the commercial and Medicare payer, and there's some option to, as commercial might deteriorate a bit, to uh, close that gap with with um, opening the door a little bit more to folks that are um, Medicare patients. We were not intentionally choosing a patient based on their insurance status. It's kind of the luck of the draw of who walks in the door and who has a need. So it isn't really something that we're actively managing. I just think it's a, a nature of the the mix of the services that we're providing. It um, you know, We're at least fortunate as a critical access hospital that you know with Medicare we're, we're getting cost-based reimbursement um, and so it isn't it isn't the worst payer mix to, to grow necessarily, um, but it certainly is a, a significant gap between you know the reimbursement that we would get from a commercial patient. But Thank you. Okay, does that answer your question? Okay. Robin? Thank you. Um, thank you both. Um, it's, it's good to see you both again, and, I'm, and I will also miss you, Art, but congratulations and good luck in your, you. in your new role. Uh, and Deborah Lee, nice to see you, and uh, congratulations to you as well. Thank you. Um, I just wanted to ask whether there were any other um, key leadership positions that you currently have vacant. Yeah. So our right, we had. I was just making sure I was, I was right on this. So. As far as our director level uh, positions, I'll just cover that first. We, we, we're really happy with the directors that we have brought in and the ones that have been there for a long time at Copley. They're, they're very strong. Uh, the one area that we uh, had somebody depart for a great opportunity was the director of quality, which we, we highly value quality uh, because of everything that's going on now and the things that we talked about in the future moving away for fee for service it's it's really going to be centered around quality so we had an interim person who we just recently promoted to the permanent position and she's doing great things and has a lot of experience worked at across the street at the FQHC we steal each other's <laughs> uh, staff it, we don't even talk about it it just happens we don't take it personal people sometimes want to change and she wanted to change and she's doing great things but she also understands the primary care side to what we were talking about before is very valuable on the senior team Leah Hollenberger who is our VP of marketing 
um, and community relations. Uh, unfortunately, and I haven't talked to the president of uh, Northern University, is that what we're calling it, uh, Northern, uh, yet, who I know, stole her from us, um, from a foundation. So basically you have the two universities that are combining in many aspects and they're combining their foundation, so they're, they're fundraising. And Leah has been with us for 11 years, um, and it's just, uh, she talked to the president, and then they got to talking about this position, and then boom, it happened. And so right now we have two excellent candidates for, for that position that we're looking to bring in later this month, and I expect to have one of those two on board um, right about probably when I'm departing. But Thank that's you. it. Thank you. You're welcome. Um, it sounds like your board is, has a great uh, plan moving forward in terms of an interim and, and managing the transitions, uh, but one of my concerns is that there has been a lot of top leadership change at your institution, which is going to be tough, especially given the other circumstances that you're in. As Kevin said, you have really seen a perfect storm right. uh, this past year. Um, I would just, a comment, I would say personally, at looking at uh, all of our critical access hospitals that we are concerned about um, to follow up on what Kevin and Jess brought up. I am, you, this, you are one of the critical access hospitals that I am more concerned about in terms of longer term sustainability given all of the dynamics that Jess and Kevin mentioned. So um, I just wanted to make that comment. Mm -hmm. I think there's others who obviously in the short term might be uh, right. a little more at risk, but uh, just in terms of strategic direction, I, I just wanted to say that I do hope that your board is thinking big picture and is aware of some of the national issues yeah. that critical access hospitals are facing because I think moving forward, uh, planning for that is yeah. going to be key uh, in order to, to maintain the strategy. So that's all from me. Thank you. Thank you, Robin. Maureen? Oh, I'm sure. I just, you know, just wanted to talk a little bit about, you know, the concept really for rebasing and, um, you know, the comment that you guys put with rebasing would compromise your ability to generate a margin and the thing to be careful about there is, you know, you missed your top line in 18 by 2.3 percent, you're missing 3 percent this year. And you know, what a rebase would do is just, you know, if, if you had a lower top line that you had to go for, then you're going to align your expenses toward that number. So, um, you know, I do think that one of the things, you know, we've been talking to the other hospitals about is, you know, we, we change the guidance for next year. And so one of the guidance changes is that, you know, you would be, if you were trending below when we were looking at your actual, you'd, you'd be able to go about 5% above there. So, you know, you're pretty close, you know, that to, to not, if you did that, you might end up at 2.5% above rather than 3.5% above. So, you know, I don't know that we would necessarily rebase you. But, and I also think that with the circumstances, particularly with the orthopedic, that you would be able to build a bridge to show you know, why you're missing 19, right. and then what the change in 20, assuming that um, reverses, you know, why you might be higher. So, you know, we're not making recommendations today. It's going to be down the road, and okay. I don't know that, you know, I would be, I probably would not be pushing to do a formal rebase, but the concern with us is really more the underlying trend of, of losing money for the past couple of years and you're doing a lot of great work and you're showing that and what your right. cost savings and things like that. It's just, you know, that has to be realistically aligned and, you know, it's tough because of the circumstance you have with an orthopedic and not knowing when that's going to change and reverse. So, yeah. you know, that's really the caution I would put on you is, you know, really keep on top of that, what's going on with your NPR. You have payer mix shifts that are hurting you the other way yeah. as well. and. You know, you are one of the hospitals, I would also say, is a long-term concern because it's not sustainable and rate changes aren't going to get you there. You know, I mean, right. there's only so much you can do even if you come by and ask for a rate change. It's it's not what's going to drive the big change right. to, to change your... Not long-term. Your, you know, your outlook. Yeah, we, we agree with you on that. Thank you. And just one other comment on the, you know, ACO piece, um, yeah. you know, being one of the only hospitals that have not joined that and, you know, don't know if you've talked to them about 
helping you with your reserve issues because you know they did backstop a couple hospitals right. and I'm not trying to speak for the ACO right. but if you're the last one out there and you have these concerns I mean right. you know the hope is you wouldn't have to dip in and that there would actually be right. savings but if you had some support you know on the reserve side you know how do, how would that change your yeah. outlook well they didn't uh, that that was that was my hope last time and certainly was has been on my mind for for this time so we'll see uh, as we sit down and, and start discussing that which we should be relatively soon uh, later this month because uh, fortunately now we we actually know what that model looks like on a couple slides you can understand what it means to go risk where previously it was kind of uh, you know, in, in the hinterlands as far as any of us understanding. So last year was the first time I got a presentation that really showed what your risk was going to be, what you were paying on a monthly basis, what your top upside versus your downside was. And uh, part of that was that we started pretty late in the process where I think we all felt like to include our boards, felt like we were being crunched for making a decision without really thoroughly vetting that. And so the hope with the CEO of uh, FQHC, um, the COO of OneCare and uh, Team Copley is that we can really vet it appropriately and maybe do something like that. So I'm hopeful. I believe it's the direction that we're going, but I just can't do a $400,000 risk. You guys see the numbers. It, it just wouldn't be smart. But we want to be part of the solution, and we're doing a number of the things that are causing us to lose revenue that we would benefit from financially if we were in one care. So we're already shifting that. And I haven't even talked about the utilization management that we're doing regularly with our patients that are inpatient, that we're getting out the door quicker because they don't need to be in our hospital any longer, regardless of what some of the family members might want, because there's a snowstorm coming that day, so let's have them stay another day in the hospital. And we say, no, we, they, they're ready to go home, or they're ready for home health, or, or whatever. So I agree completely. Thank you. Thanks. Other questions from the board? If not, we'll open it up to public comment and questions. Jeff. Thank you. I'm sorry. <laughs> I, I, I can't believe he said that. I'm so embarrassed. <laughs> Thank you, Jeff. Other public comment or questions? Seeing none, I want to uh, thank you for coming down and uh, thank you. really thank you. giving us a great update on how things are going at Copley. Um, we, as far as our timeline, we will be looking to make enforcement decisions um, as early as next Friday, the 19th. 
Okay. And um, just again, echoing everybody else, we want to wish you well in your new ventures. We're, we wish you weren't leaving, um, mm -hmm. but um, I'm sure that uh, you know uh, Team Copley will survive because there's uh, a real strong uh, sense of community there that um, yeah. really wants to see this institution um, be all that it can be. So absolutely. Um, Thank you again. Thank you. So with that, is there any old business to come before the board? Seeing none, is there any new business to come before the board? Seeing none, is there a motion to adjourn?